The reading today comes from Barbara Brown Taylor. She's uh, an Episcopal priest, uh, professor, and now a writer from her book, An Altar in the World. She says this, If I had a dollar for every time I heard someone say I am spiritual but not religious, then I might not be any wiser about what that means, but I would be richer. I hear the phrase on the radio, I read it in interviews, people often say it to my face when they learn that I am a religion professor who spent years as a parish priest. I think I know what they mean by religious. It is the spiritual part that is harder to grasp. It may be the name for a longing, for more meaning, more feeling, more connection, more life. When I hear people talk about spirituality, that seems to be what they are describing. They know there is more to life than what meets the eye. They have drawn close to this more in nature, in love, in art, in grief. They would be happy for someone to teach them how to spend more time in the presence of this deeper reality. But when they visit the places where such knowledge is supposed to be found, they often find the rituals hollow and the language antique. Where is the secret hidden? Who has the key to the treasure box of more? People seem willing to look all over the place for this treasure. They, are, they will spend hours launching prayers into heaven they will travel halfway around the world to visit a monastery in India or to take part in a mission trip to Belize. The last place most people look is right under their feet in the everyday activities, accidents, and encounters of their lives. What possible spiritual significance could a trip to the grocery store have? How could something as common as a toothache be a door to greater life? No one longs for what he or she already has, and yet the accumulated insight of those wise about the spiritual life suggests that the reason so many of us cannot see the red X that marks the spot is because we are standing on it. <laughs> the treasure we seek requires no lengthy expedition, no expensive equipment, no superior aptitude or special company. All we lack is the willingness to imagine that we, are alre we already have everything we need. The only thing missing is our consent to be where we are. She continues. Many years ago now, a wise old priest invited me to come speak at his church in Alabama. What do you want me to talk about, I asked him. Come tell us what is saving your life now, he answered. It was as if he had swept his arm across a dusty table and brushed all the formal china to the ground. I did not have to try to say correct things that were true for everyone. I did not have to use theological language that conformed to the historical teachings of the church. All I had to do was figure out what my life depended on. All I had to do was figure out how I stayed as close to that reality as I could and then find some way to talk about it that helped my listeners figure out those same things for themselves. The answers I gave all those years ago are not the same answers I would give today. That is the beauty of the question. But the principle is the same. What is saving my life now is the conviction that there is no spiritual treasure to be found apart from the bodily experiences of human life on earth. My life depends on engaging the most ordinary physical activities with the most exquisite attention I can give them. My life depends on ignoring all touted distinctions between the secular and the sacred the physical and the spiritual, the body and the soul. What is saving my life now is becoming more fully human, 
trusting that there is no way to God apart from real life in the real world. Barbara Brown Taylor.